This episode is the second in a series of four on suicide prevention and the church, and it is pre-recorded. I'm Rachel Keefe, and this is Monday's Muse. In this week's episode, I'm going to talk to you about a concept called psychache. Psychache can be very helpful in understanding the experiences of someone who is suicidal. I'll be reading from the Life Saving Church, the first chapter, which is called The Body of Christ is Suicidal, and the concluding section, which is called Psychache. I often describe my teenage years as a period of romancing death. I didn't necessarily want to die as much as I wanted the pain to end. I had a very romantic notion of death as being a peaceful escape from everything I could not face. If I could have imagined another way to rid myself of pain, I don't think I would have courted death quite as long. I was trapped though, and had no conception that life wouldn't always be so hard or so painful. Even before I was caught in the torment of an eating disorder, I described myself as living in a box. It was a two-way mirror box. I could see out, but people looking at me saw mostly what they wanted to see. Rarely would I feel as if someone could actually see that I was trapped in my pain. I truly felt I was confined there, bound in chains with no hope of release. My feelings were a mystery to me and I couldn't articulate them. I felt all caged up with no way out. This is how I describe my life at 16. A few years ago, I was at a conference where I heard a paper presented on psychache. Even though I had been an outpatient therapist and a clinical chaplain at a psychiatric hospital, this was a new term for me. Psychache, a term coined by Edwin Schneidman, describes intense, unbearable psychological pain that results from significant unmet psychological needs. When left unresolved, psychic leads to suicide or at least suicidal thoughts or behaviors. When I first heard this term, it shifted my understanding of myself and the patients with whom I worked. To my knowledge, Snydman doesn't say anything about spiritual needs when he refers to psychic. However, for me, this term encompasses more than depression or PTSD or other diagnoses a suicidal person might receive. It speaks to the need to love and be loved and to belong somewhere with someone. These are psychological needs that, when unmet, lead to maladaptive behaviors. They are also spiritual needs that, when unmet, lead to incredible pain pain that is overwhelming and unspeakable and unbreakable. Psychic truly feels insurmountable. It can't be surgically cut out, starved out, purged out, run out, drowned out, smoked out, or snorted out. It's the kind of pain that drives a person to self-destruction by any means at hand, sometimes by multiple means. Psychic is, as Schneidman points out, pain, not illness. It can't be cured, but it can be healed. In seminary, I had the privilege of studying with Dr. James Loder. He put spiritual development and faith formation alongside psychological development. He used the works of Eric Erickson and Jean Piaget to lay a foundation for spiritual development. He spoke about faith saving us from the void. As Loder described it, the void is the place of emptiness, nothingness, longing, or, in other words, the place where God is not. The void, to my understanding, is the birthplace of psychache. As an infant grows, she needs affirmation and confirmation that she is not alone in the world and there are others who will meet her needs. When those basic needs aren't met, a void develops in her and the ache begins. Loder taught me the language of faith and the possibility of a joyful life in the spirit. Many years later, at an American Psychological Association Division 36 Society for the Psychology of Religion conference, I learned the word for the pain I had lived with, 
Yes, I was depressed. Yes, I had PTSD. Yes, I had an eating disorder. However, none of those described my pain. Before all those things manifested, there was psychic. The overwhelming pain of feeling unwanted, dismissed, ignored, rejected, bullied, and abused. It is essential that the church understand psychic because we are called to care for the most vulnerable among us, those who are dismissed and unwanted and unseen and bullied and tormented. We need to talk more about this and learn more about this and how to reach beyond the barriers that psychic can place between the one who suffers and the one who wants to help. If you're wondering what your congregation can do now to be better at suicide prevention, the, each chapter in the book concludes with what your congregation can do now. And here are a couple of suggestions. Use the resources of your denomination or another denomination to develop a mental health ministry in your congregation. For example, the Mental Health Network of the United Church of Christ has the WISE, Welcoming, Inclusive, Supportive, and Engaged Program for Mental Health. And talk about suicide and the resources available. Remember that by talking about suicide or asking someone if they are suicidal, you do not cause someone to engage in suicidal behavior. If you or someone you know is suicidal, please reach out for help. The National Suicide Prevention Hotline is 1-800-273-8255. I hope this series on suicide prevention in the church is helpful. We cannot underestimate the importance of the role church can play in saving lives. The Life Saving Church was released by Chalice Press on May 1st, and the early responses have been overwhelmingly positive. I think everyone should read this book. If you don't have your copy, the ordering information is in the description below. If you would like to talk about organizing an event, a conference, a speaking engagement, or you have questions, please be in touch. Thanks for joining us for this series. Regular episodes of Monday's Muse will resume on June 25th.